Hey guys, welcome to Oasis Church and thanks for tuning in. My name is Pastor Brady and this is my wife Renita. We're so glad you joined us today. Our prayer is that your faith and your heart will be strengthened as you listen to the word. God bless you as you listen. Man, I can't think of a better song to sing before we open the word together. And that was just awesome. What an incredible prayer. Um, so thankful for the sufficiency of God's word. You know? I mean, that it's not dependent on me having the greatest personality in the world. It's not dependent on, like, how slick my delivery is. Like, his word is sufficient. It's sufficient for every single thing that every single one of you are facing right now. Isn't that encouraging? Man, that, that's why that song is so weighty. Because it's just like, we just, we, we, just, we just have the posture of, like, we know your word is sufficient. We know that you know us more than we know ourselves. We know that you know how broken we are better than we do. And then we just take the posture of little Samuel, right? Speak, Lord, for your servants listening. Isn't that beautiful? Man, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. You know, and we're, we're all there together before the Lord saying, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Man, that's just so encouraging. And so, Spirit, we do pray that. We sang it, and I just reiterate it, Father. Speak, for your servant is listening. Speak to us. Uh, if you got your Bibles, go ahead and open them to Matthew chapter 14. We're going to be jumping back in this week. Oh, I have a couple announcements. I asked them to write me on a three-by-five card so I would not forget. Uh, the tailgate is canceled this afternoon. Everybody say, oh. Yeah, I know. So it's going to be next week. Um, we, it was, they were calling for a torrential downpour today, but now it looks beautiful. So what are you going to do? Um, right. And maybe it'll rain again or, or something. Uh, this is big. Hey, ladies Hey, ladies, mother and daughter tea Saturday, May 6th. Can you come to that? If you're not a mother, I was going to say, if you're not a daughter, but everybody's a daughter. If they're... Girls. Twins, you said? Twins. Tweens. Twins are also invited. If you're a twin, we want you to feel extra welcome. Um, and guys, this is a big one, okay? Compassion Sunday is going to be on Mother's Day. We are going to do a baby dedication. And so signups for that are in the back. I'll just say that. And by the end of the service, they'll be there, even if they're not. Um, Compassion Sunday, guys. Wes Stafford's coming, the president of Compassion International. Those of you haven't heard of it, it's kind of like the Walt Disney of like, taking care of impoverished children overseas. Um, I've hung out with this guy a lot. He's the real deal. He is, it, it's a big, like he, just because of his schedule, because of his availability and his age, like he usually just goes to churches that are much, 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 much larger. That's not because he's not a humble servant or thinks he's anything. That's just because of the limitations of being his age and being, and, and his availability. He's coming here because me and him wept on an island in the middle of Missouri River talking about kids ministry. And, uh, and we really connected, and uh, I caught some fish, almost killed him on a UTV. No joke. I really did get a little aggressive on there. Anyway, he's going to be here May 14th. Uh, really, bring your friends, but it's going to be, it's a special treat to have him. We're going to have, it's our Compassion Sunday. We're going to have the journey, which is like a walkthrough um, journey of a, a life, a day in the life of a child in poverty. And uh, it's going to be set up in the, um, the, I always forget the name of this building. This building over here, Family Life Center. Is that right? Life building. This one over here, it's going to be set up there. We're going to have like uh, virtual reality headsets for some of the people that want to do that. Um, and then Wes is going to speak. And then we're going to get an opportunity to sponsor some kids in poverty. So mark your calendars. Please be here for that. Um, okay, if you haven't already turned to Matthew 14, look on with a friend. Uh, we're going to be reading there together uh, this morning. And um, we're going to be jumping back into God's word together. Um, so we've seen a progression this is going to be like a 10-second recap. We've seen a progression since Matthew chapter 11. Matthew, Matthew chapter 11 was highlighting what? The majesty of the Lord Jesus, right? The majesty of Christ. Matthew 12, we were contrasting the character of Christ with the, with the character of the Pharisees and Sadducees. That was 12. 13, we, uh, he starts breaking out all the parables, remember? And he gives us seven kingdom parables this is a parable is a story that illustrates important truths about the kingdom that Jesus was coming to preach. But also in Matthew 13, we said this last week, it records what's the beginning of a turning point in Jesus' ministry. 
um, as more opposition builds up against Christ, his disciples, and their preaching. See, the Pharisees, we've been talking about what? Since we started Matthew, right? They, they were at the, almost the very beginning. We could see them starting to, starting to swirl against an opposition against Christ. But now even the crowds are starting to doubt him. Why? He's not what we wanted. He's not quite the Messiah we were hoping for, right? They wanted someone who could bring immediate physical relief. They wanted someone who would kick the tails of the Romans and get them out. They wanted David 2.0. That's what they wanted, right? They wanted uh, perhaps someone to deliver them, but Christ had not turned out to be exactly what they hoped for. So in the wake of the crowd's disappointment with him, the opposition of the Pharisees, Herod trying to kill him, as we saw last week, all of that is the context that we're in this morning. So that kind of helps you get in the story, right? Um, Christ does three things in this context. He withdraws from Galilee. He goes across the lake to the north side, and he seeks a place of solitude and rest for him and his disciples. And in that context, we come to the passage we're going to look at and study today. So let's, uh, let's read the Word of God together. If you would, stand to your feet out of uh, an abundance of love and respect for the Word of God. We're going to pick up in verse 13. If you're there, say, uh-huh. uh-huh. Now, when the Lord Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, and he healed their sick. Now, when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves. And Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They said to him, We have only five loaves here and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass, and taking the five loaves and two fish, he looked up into heaven and and said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples, to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they all ate and were satisfied, and and they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces left over, and those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. This is God's holy perfect and an errant word. May he write its eternal truths on all of our hearts. Would you pray with me? Father, we ask you, we ask that by your spirit, you would make this your word food to us this day, spiritual food. We ask that by it, you would bring to mind those things that we need to confess to you. And so cause us, please cause us to repent. We ask as well, Lord, that you would come near to us if we're discouraged or broken down or depressed, and you would encourage us by your word. But in whatever way your word should speak to us, we ask that it would be done. And we ask that you would use this preaching of your word and our active hearing, speak, O Lord, hearing of the word for the spiritual good of our souls, and the building up of Christ's kingdom. We ask this all in the mighty name of Jesus. If you agree with that, say amen. Amen. You can be seated. So when you come to chapter 14, we're coming to the end of what scholars call the great Galilean ministry. Remember we talked about that last week, and we come into the ministry of the rejected king. Um, he's been ministering in Galilee for since about AD 27 till around April, ironically, of AD 29. Uh, so he's had a two-year two ministry in Galilee that's coming to an end here. Um, William Henderson says this, One more year and the Lamb of God will, by means of a cross, render satisfaction for the sins of all who trust in him. So at this significant point, uh, Jesus performs his most famous miracle, Um, likely his most famous miracle, the feeding of the 5,000 while ministering on the northeast side of Galilee. 
The fact of the feeding of the 5,000 is the only one of Jesus' many miracles that are recorded in all four gospel, gospels testifies to its unique importance. In each gospel account, this miracle is placed at the climax, the pinnacle of Jesus' ministry. Um, so let's look at this passage together and see what truths Christ has for us this morning. Um, as we look at this, the first thing that I want to see as we look at the text is I want to look at the seclusion of Christ. The seclusion of Christ, the, the, the stepping away. It's important for us to remember that while being fully God, Jesus was also fully man. It's hard to imagine, isn't it? It's hard to imagine Jesus, like my little boy Asen, running around the church and skinning his knees. And, you know, he learned to read. He learned to write. He learned to pray. He was a human boy uh, and a man. We know he got hungry, thirsty, uh, tired. He, um, he, he spoke. He sang. He prayed. He grieved. He wept. And most humanly, one day he died. So our text today has an inclusio, which is a, which is a really you know, like a five-cent word for sandwich. It has a sandwich um, in which Jesus uh, is, is trying to get away and to contemplate and to rest and to ponder. Um, he desires to get away from the crowd and his disciples in order to, as John puts it, linger in prayer. Uh, look at, and, and keep in mind this. Verse 12 had just happened. Remember what happened in verse 12? And his disciples came and took the body of John the Baptist and buried it, the beheaded body. And they went and told Jesus. I mean, they likely told him everything we read about in verses 1 through 11, all that happened. Remember what we read about last week, the horrible details of John's death? And then it says, now when Jesus heard this, when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place means a desert or a wilderness by himself. We're not told where, um, but we are told what happens when he gets there. Who's there? The paparazzi are there with their cameras and their, you know, they're there, right? But the crowds, when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd. So here's the sandwich, the inclusio. Jesus saw the crowd that killed his compassion. He was trying to get away. I mean, he got contemplation. He was trying to get away. At least it paused it. And then we see the miracles of the feeding and the healing, etc. And then it says in verse 22, the other end of the sandwich, the other bun, immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. So plan A was, I'm going to get in the boat and get away. All right, so that didn't work. Uh, plan B, so he went to plan B. You disciples get in the boat and off you go. Bye-bye, see you later on the other side. How would Jesus get to the other side? Disciples didn't know, right? So he dismisses the crowd, and off they go because they've been healed, fed, and taught. And then finally comes verse 23. It says, he finally went up to the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, at last, he was there alone. So do you guys see what's happening? You see this? Jesus hears of John's death. He wants some seclusion and some solitude. Plan A, a boat escape. Plan B, feed them, heal, heal them, send them. And then once the coast is clear, literally, uh -huh, up the mountain he goes for a time alone to contemplate and to pray. What was on his mind? I mean, we can only speculate, but speculate we shall. Um, I think, obviously, he said when he heard of John's death. So I think it was safe to say John's death was, was, was on his mind. Um, I think he grieved because in the same way he grieved when Lazarus died. I mean, this is his good friend. This is his cousin. But I think he thought about John's death also, as we talked about last week, in light of his own. As we saw earlier, John's passion in verses 1 through 11 foreshadows or shows us a picture of Christ's passion that's coming. Um, like John, innocent Jesus would suffer and die at the hands of of political powers of his day. Jesus knew that. He also knew that with John down, he was next. So I think he thought about what humans think when they lose a loved one. I also think he thought about the Garden of Gethsemane. I think he thought about the 39 lashes. I think he thought about falling on the road to Golgotha. I think he thought about the nails, the thirst, the laughter at the foot of the cross, the rejection, the loneliness. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
He thought of the loneliness of the atonement. I think he thought of becoming sin so that we might become the righteousness of God through faith in him. I think he thought about the cross of Calvary. On this this mountain, I think he thought of that mountain. On a hill far away, he thought of a hill that was no longer that far away. It was closing in. And so it's, it's that thought that makes what happens between this sandwich so astounding. Look again at verse 14. Jesus gets on a boat to get away. But when he steps off the boat, a sea of people crash against him. So much for solitude, right? So when I'm writing a sermon, when I'm concentrating, um, or Renita, not to, not to uh, embarrass you, babe, but when she's cooking, right? I mean, she's like, like, like a tractor beam, man. It's hard. Like, I'm like, um, honey, like, <laughs> there's an earthquake. She's just like, the icing goes here. And just, I mean, she is just boom. Um, I thought I was one track by, but she's cooking. I mean, it is like all in. So, but, you know, I'm studying or whatever, and, and there's a distraction or, you know, one of my uh, quivers that the Lord's given me is, or one of the arrows in my quiver is like coming up. I also have multiple quivers. No, I'm just kidding. Um, and, uh, you know, coming in, I get, I get, you know, I don't really get uh, compassionate. I get consternated, right? <laughs> or uh, that's consternated, not constipated, right? Consternated. Um, you know, uh, but look at verse 14. It's so beautiful. It tells us so much about the heart of Christ, his very heart. Here is the heart of God laid open before us. Worship him. Learn from him. He teaches us the importance of rest and solitude, even in the midst of serving the Lord, even in the midst of difficult times. Sometimes rest can't be attained in a way or time that we prefer. Amen, parents? And here's our second point. Not only do we learn and see and learn from the seclusion of Christ, what he experienced and was going through, and how we should learn the importance of rest and solitude as well, even when we're in the middle of serving the Lord, but also, we also learn about the splakidzomai of Christ. Now, look, that has two benefits. A, it's an S just like the first one, okay? Seclusion of Christ, the split kids of mine. But it's also a great word. It, it, it's, it's the actual Greek word for compassion. It means from the guts, from the bowels. It means to be moved in one's bowels, where the, and this is where the ancients considered the emotions or the feelings reside. The compassion, the servant-heartedness, the heartbrokenness of Christ. Jesus felt pain. He experienced genuine, not, not, not put on genuine, anguish um, for the suffering of other people. You see this all over the word of God, whether they were a believer or an unbeliever, whether they were Jew or Gentile, whether it was a man or woman, whether it was somebody who was poor or somebody who was rich. You see Jesus again and again and again. You see this compassion of Christ. He shows us the splakidzomai, the heart of God. And again, appreciate the context. Appreciate the context He was tired. He just found out his cousin's head had been cut off. He knew he was coming next. His mind was on the cross. That's that's the context. Appreciate it. He needed rest. He needed time to pray and ponder and weep over John. There was never a better time or a more reasonable time in Jesus' whole ministry when he could have rightly said, look, guys, I'm tired. I'm tired. Please go home. I need rest. I've been ministering constantly in Galilee nonstop. My disciples need rest. We're under the gun because of Herod. I need time to think, and I need time to pray. I mean, imagine the pressure at any time that you knew you could lose your life. Imagine the pressure of that. At any moment, you could be murdered. You could be killed, right? Um, Imagine the exhaustion of not having a break in the process of needing to process tragedy. But behold, the heart of God is laid before you this morning. When Jesus steps ashore and sees the crowd, guys, don't miss this. His reaction is immediate and instinctive. He does three things when he sees the multitudes. Matthew tells us he feels compassion. 
for the multitudes. He feels compassion for the multitudes. It's not, and it's not just simply a feeling, not just simply an emotional response because it manifests itself in two other things. He doesn't just feel compassion for them, but what does he do? He heals them. He heals them. He began to heal their sick. And Matthew doesn't tell it, but Mark, Luke, and John do. He not only had compassion on them and healed them, but he taught them. So he felt compassion for them. He healed them, and he preached a sermon. So Jesus' response to the needs of others in a time of his great need, he has compassion on them. He heals them, heals their sick, and he cares for them. He demonstrates not just an attitude of compassion, which Americans are good at, but acts of compassion. When Moses heard from God, this reminds me of this, when Moses heard about God, from God, remember in Exodus 34 on Mount Sinai, this is what the Lord said about the Lord. Remember, dad preached a sermon one time when God leads the first worship service. He says, the Lord, the Lord. This is God talking about himself. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. We see that here in Jesus. We see it right here in Jesus. We couldn't, we shouldn't underestimate the importance of this picture. I mean, it clearly impacted the disciples, right? Every single one of them, this is the one miracle that they all wrote down. They clearly thought it was of massive importance. So Jesus gets out of the boat. He begins to minister to people. And the disciples, very, very practically minded. How many of y'all practical people in the house, right? Very practical minded people. Well, you should be able to connect with this, right? So uh, they come to him at the end of the day and they say, Lord, the hour for buying food and even for eating food has come and gone. And, and we're in a remote location. There's not one town where all these folks can go buy food. And besides, all the shops are closing up. The marketplace is closing up and people are going home. It's gonna be dark soon. We're in a lonely, isolated place where there's no food that they can gather. The hour's already late. Lord, you need to send these people home. So I lived in South Sudan for a while. And I think in, in some of these passages really helped me connect because I feel like Sudan probably was somewhat of a picture of what ancient Israel may have been like. I mean, and look, when the sun goes, when the sun starts even getting close to down, I mean, like, forget about it. Like, you have missed your chance. There are no midnight runs to Walmart. There is no food line open until 11. I mean, that's it. Sorry, right? I hope you have a granola bar in your bag because, like, that's it, right? Well, that's, that's what's happening. Jesus responds to them. Just picture this moment. So they're just like, Lord, like, we're in the middle of nowhere, right? We're... There is nothing to give these people. And Jesus looks at him and he says, no, you feed them. The disciples were, of course, at a loss. I mean, can you imagine when he said that? Can you They're just probably like, like looking at each other, right? But Jesus' words to them were exactly consistent with his own compassion towards the multitudes. See, Jesus was showing compassion towards the multitudes and he wanted his disciples to have compassion towards the multitudes as well. Right? You can almost hear the disappointment in Jesus' voice later on when he says, bring it to me. You know, it's, it's, like, it's like longing for a glass of water in front of Niagara Falls, right? It's just like, and you're like, man, where's the water? And it's like, you got, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, Jesus' response to the crowds following him serves to impress upon his disciples. Don't miss this. This is, this is a good morsel of meat from the word to take with us. Jesus' response to the crowds following him serves to impress upon his disciples the mandate for their own self-sacrificial ministry. It's a good push for us in 2023. Jesus had called his disciples to be shepherds of the flock. And in this passage, he's giving them an example of how you do that. The shepherd denies himself for the sake of the flock. That's the example he's setting for them. The disciples are just so pragmatic, they're so practical. They wanted to send the people home, but Christ, because he knew that he was the people's shepherd, he desired to care for them. And he wanted his disciples to have the same type of attitude. You read that, take that passage in the New Testament, have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He wanted them to have the same attitude to ministering to the flock. Again, William Henderson says this, the needs of people Sick and ignorant and discontent and, and disconsolate and hungry meant far more to Jesus 
than his own convenience and ease. And so he healed the sick. He put all the emotional baggage that he was facing, his tired body, the emotional baggage of his cousin's head being lopped off and all the suffering and the mourning that goes with that. He put all that aside and he meant, and, and you know what else he put aside? We're gonna get into this more in a minute. He put aside not only his own needs, but he put aside their earthly materialistic motivations for even wanting to be around Jesus. We've hit on that before, but there was a lot of people, probably most, were following him to see something cool or to get some free stuff. And he puts that aside. Guys, this, man, this was, this was convicting. He puts it aside for following him. We can't miss this. By doing this under these circumstances, Jesus was also setting an example for you and for me, for his church. Jesus is modeling perfectly for us here, self-denial for the sake of ministry. Guys, we need this push today. And he was modeling compassion. Man, we need this one compassion on people who are hard in their hearts. Are y'all sitting under that with me? That's a little heavy, isn't it? You feel that? Compassion on people who are hard in their hearts. If you read the John 6 account of this very uh, text, it's a little longer, a little more detailed. It's, it's very clear that the people were they were quite attracted. They were quite drawn. They were quite mesmerized by Jesus' ability to heal. Surprise, surprise. But they weren't interested at all in his claim to be the Messiah who was setting up not an earthly kingdom, but a spiritual kingdom. In fact, John tells us that when Jesus when preached the message, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you will not inherit eternal life. You will have no part of my kingdom. It says they were offended. Oof, how dare you? They were offended. Now, Jesus knew that. He knew the crowd wasn't necessarily following him for spiritual reasons, right? He knew that they weren't all following him for like quiet, quiet walks with, what's that book? Quiet walks, quiet talks with the Lord, right? They, 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 they weren't following him for the right spiritual motives. And yet, and yet, we see his heart go out to them. Wow. He shows them compassion despite the state of their hearts. And in doing so, he gives, them, he gives his disciples an example and he gives us an example of, of how to live our lives and how to be used of the Lord. Guys, at Oasis, we have, we have a legacy um, for loving the word of God. We love the word. I've, t- I've spoken to so many of you about your love for the word of God and, 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 and solid truth and doctrine. You love the word. The inerrant word has been faithfully ministered in this pulpit from the day it was built 16 years ago. And may God continue that, amen? We have a growing heart for giving here and for giving to the mission. It's growing. But I think we have a, we're have a long way. We have a long way to grow in exactly this area. We need to show the same kind of zeal that we do for God's word and sound doctrine and to the cause of the mission. We need to show the same kind of emphasis in our compassion towards those in need, not only in our own church, because we have people showing up here week to week to week hurting, amen? And, and, and many times people will come in here on a Sunday. Now, I praise God for the times this isn't true, but many times people will come in on a Sunday and they'll be unattended to. Why is that? It's not because anyone like willfully hates them. It's just that we're in our own comfort zones. We're talking to our friends. We're saying what's up and talking to people that we haven't seen in a few days. We're, we're, some of us are doing business and other things that, that, we, that shouldn't be our focus. And many times they go unattended to. And we're not, we're not walking. Here's the thing. We're not walking with a mindset of showing compassion to one another, of looking for opportunities to show compassion for each other. But then there's another step, isn't there? There's all those people just a, fle- a few blocks from us in desperate need and in incredible brokenness. On your street, your neighbors, the people who work in the cubicle next to you, the desperate in need of the gospel, going through intense pain. And we, as the people of God, have a mandate from our Savior to care about them, not simply to feel compassion towards them or to feel guilty 
or to throw money in an offering plate every once in a while in their direction, but to tangibly with our own hands to touch them and to show them compassion. When God brings about the day when our love for the word is matched for, our, for the manifestation of compassion that's called for here in his word, man, that's the day that I think we could rightly say we're in a revival. Will you, will you pray for that with me? Will you join me in praying that God would do that here? I mean that with all my heart. I mean, is that the desire of your heart? That, that you'd manifest a strong love for truth but, and an equal love for one another and a compassion for those in need? Isn't that what Christ is modeling here? Man, what a force that would be in Amherst County, Lynchburg, and Nelson. Ah, oh, what would the world be able to see? What would the world be able to say when that kind of love is manifested for the word and compassion for those in need? So com the compassion of Christ is to be the compassion of this church. And we love in word, but we also love in deed and in action because God in Christ, what? Loved us first. Loved us first. But as we look back at our text, let me ask you, is this miracle only to serve as a perpetual motivation for Christian action and compassion? To keep us leading the world's charge with healing the sick and feeding the poor? And it does. No, there's another reason. There's a greater reason. Our third point, the supply of Christ. Jesus demonstrates that all the power for ministry comes through him. Look at verses 16 through 20. You see there, not only does Christ set an example for his disciples and for us, but Christ also displays his divine power in an extraordinary way. We need to appreciate the Lord's power here. We need to appreciate the Lord's power. We, we have an account of Jesus calling for the disciples to bring him the loaves and the fishes to let him show them how he will provide for the multitudes. Now, they, they, they say, uh, like, every, everybody who studied this text, you know, kind of does the math on it. They say, if this is just men, if it's 5,000 just men, and given that time in the world and how many people statistically would have had uh, wives um, and kids, you know, even if we use the suburbanite two and a half, right, kids or whatever, um, as the pollsters like to put it, that's nearly 24,000 people. I mean, that's a lot of holy mackerel. Right? That's a lot of bread. Right? Um, and there's several lessons that the disciples needed to learn in the command that Jesus gave them. Remember in verse 16, after they said, Lord, they said, let's send them home. Send them home. He says, no, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. There's three important lessons in that command for us. You give them something to eat. The first lesson is this. He's teaching them the responsibility to minister. The responsibility to minister. Have you ever noticed how often in the Gospels, the disciples respond to someone coming to Christ by saying, in effect, get out of here. Go away. Have you ever noticed that? In Matthew 15, we're going to come to a passage where there's a Canaanite woman, and she comes to the Lord Jesus for help, and you know what the disciples tell her? Go away. Go away. Well, that's evangelistic, right? Way to go, guys, right? And then there's another passage. You remember when they're bringing the children to Christ and they want Christ's blessing on the children and you know what the disciples say to them? Don't bother the master with your kids. Get the little brats out of here, All right? Go away. Leave us alone. This is the core missionary force that's gonna take the world. Yes, in the sense of the kids, and sad in the sense that that's also talking about the disciples who should have, like, this is them. And they're just like, go away. Get out of here. We're tired. Stop bothering us. The disciples are constantly telling people, in effect, don't bother the master and don't bother us. Get out of here. Go away. You give them. And then they, Jesus says, no, you give them something to eat. He's saying his disciples and he's saying to us, I'm placing the responsibility on you to minister. We talked about this membership class this morning, that this is one of the things that, that, we, that we say, everybody wants to become a member here. It's just like, this is, if you're looking for a, a, a top-down, all the powers at the top, 
and wait for a good program to come along before you do any ministry, that you're going to be disappointed here. We're an entrepreneurial church, right? If God gives you an idea, go for it. We'll bless it in some kind of way, unless it's just horrible or against the scriptures. Like, go for it, right? And so this is, this is what he's saying. He's empowering him. He's just like, I'm placing the responsibility on you, on each of you. I'm placing the responsibility for you to minister. It's not an option. That's anti-American. Listen, you don't have a choice. If you belong to Christ, you don't have a choice. You're mine, Jesus says. I've bought you with a price, a high price. You minister. You serve. Man, don't we need some of this? Golly day, we need this push, don't we? I mean, guys, we have we breathe the air more than we realize of our rights. I mean, we're, we're Americans. is what we're raised in. Even as Christians, it's still on us. It's still the air we breathe. This, the almighty, every, all knees bow to autonomy and to it's, it's, it's my choice, my individual. Every commercial, every movie, it's just, it's got traces of it all over it. We need this push. When's the last time you thought of yourself in terms of like, I'm owned? I don't really feel like it. But you don't really get a vote. I mean, if you belong to Christ, he was tortured to death on a cross for the salvation of your soul eternally. You belong to him. So that's what he's saying. He's like, no, you give. You show compassion. It's not your option to say, go away. That's not what, you're not allowed to say that. You minister. You serve. I have in parentheses, dang. That's awesome. Man, I need, I need, I need that in my life. Jesus, do more of that in my life. Help me think of myself more in that way in my life. Um, let me just say as a side note, we can't be a people that's dominated by our feelings by our emotions. You know, again, I think some of the attentiveness to that is probably better than our grandparents' generation where it was just like, I mean, they were putting stuff in the trunk until it was like, you know, damaging. Uh, you can go too far, right? But man, I feel like we have such a feeling-centric society today, right? It's, it's, it, it, they're like a two-year-old, right? So, I mean, you don't give a two-year-old the keys to your car, right? What do you do? You put them in a car seat. You uh, strap them in. Do you hear them? Yeah, you need to know if they're choking or if something's going on, right? I mean, uh, or if they need to use the bathroom or something. You need to hear from them. You don't lock them in the trunk, but you don't give them the keys to your car. Why? They'll wreck the car. That's kind of like emotions, right? They have a place, but it's a constrained place. They don't, we're not dominated by how things make us feel, right? It's quiet in here. Y'all with me? Come on. I thought that was, this is true. This is good. It's kind of, I heard a pastor say it this one, this time, this way. He said, um, emotions make great servants, but horrible masters. So that's just a, I think that's a parenthesis to that. The Lord owns you. This is, this is you. So I don't feel like it. Uh, but there's a second thing he's teaching. Uh, he's also teaching them um, by giving them this command, you teach them. He's also teaching them that in order to minister the way he wants us to minister, we cannot do it in our own power. We can't do it in our own power. Look at what he tells them to do. Feed the multitudes. Well, they immediately recognize they can't feed the multitudes. So it's obvious to them. I mean, Jesus, we got five loaves and two fish, and there's 24,000 people out there. I mean, how in the world are we going to do this? The disciples, you see, they need to learn of their own inability to carry out Christ's commands to minister before they're able to minister. Do you hear that? They need to know that they do not have the ability to minister before they're able to minister. That was helpful for me even just this morning getting up here. Um, because that ability, that power, that source, that strength is only found in Christ. And so the very command of Christ to the disciples, you feed them, is going to drive them to their knees. Drive them to their faces in dependence on Christ because they don't have a clue how they're going to do this. And frankly, they don't have a clue how Christ is going to, is going to do it right, either. So, but Because um, no matter how many miracles he's performed, this was a different one. Um, so by telling the disciples to give the crowd something to eat, Jesus is not only stressing the responsibility to minister on them, uh, to show compassion, but he's reminding them of, number two, the true source of their ability to minister. Um, 
They'll never be able to discharge the command Christ has given them in their own strength. Only Christ can do what he's told them to do. Matthew Henry puts it this way. Ministers can never fill people's hearts unless Christ fills their hands. That's how all ministry goes, isn't it? I mean, when when you're at a point where you feel unmatched for ministry and you think, Lord, there is no way I can help this person. There's no way I can help this group of people, this, this life group. I got nothing. Like all my junk is like, I got, I got, I can't tell somebody about Jesus. Man, I am so messed up. I messed up yesterday and the day before. I'm so broken. Man, you are right where God wants you. You are right where God wants you in ministry. Because all true Christian ministry is beyond our resources. All true Christian ministry is prayerfully dependent on Christ and totally dependent on the power of the Holy Spirit to do the work that we cannot do, to heal up wounded hearts, to bind up broken hearts, to raise the dead, as much as me, we might want to. Only Christ can do that. Um, Falwell used to always say, nothing of eternal significance is accomplished apart from prayer. So when Christ calls us to minister in compassion to others, he's not saying, figure out how to do this. You figure out how to get it done. You're smart. You're, you're, you're wicked keen. Get it done, right? No, he's not saying, he's saying, I want you to be so dependent on me and so reliant that you tremblingly move forward knowing that you are totally overmatched, but I am not. When you feel overwhelmed with service to Christ, Christ has you exactly where he wants you, amen? This is helping me this second, right? In fact, the worst service that we can do for Christ is when we think we can handle it ourselves. There's an old pastor who, uh, who tells the story of this young minister who went up um, on, uh, to preach, and he gets up there. He's got his he's got his Bible, and he's just like, man, I'm gonna bring the heat today. And he gets up there, and he stands up, and he's just got his points, and they all start with an S. Just kidding. No, and he's just all excited, and he's preaching, and man, it just it just falls flat, and the pe- and, the, and there's just there's just it's just a struggle the whole time. There's no response. There's no apparent move of the spirit at all, and he just and and it's just and he just falls all over the, his words, and he's confused. He's confused himself the whole time he was preaching, and and he just kind of goes down. His head's hung. He goes to the back doors. On his way out, this old minister, uh, in his eighties, comes up to him and says, "Son, if you'd gone up the way you'd come down, wait, dang it, I always mess this part up. Um, if you if you'd gone up the way you came down, you would have came down the way you went up. I was saying it right." So as we minister, we need to remember this too. We face incredible obstacles in our culture. How many of y'all, how many of y'all know? This is, this, is a, this is a crazy time to be a Christian. It's a crazy time to minister. Um, you look and you're like, man, what's gonna be? What's, gonna, what's this next generation? If this generation's like this, what's the next generation gonna be like, right? We look at our own country and we say, how in the world can we match the problems that we have to minister to? Here's the answer. We can't, but he can he can. And when we realize that we can't, but he can, man, we're going to, and we go forward in that faith and that trust and do it anyway, not knowing how he's going to minister through it. We've gotten the right answer. We've gotten the right answer. So Christ calls us to minister all the power necessary for doing the work he's called us to do comes from him, the chief shepherd, and comes from him alone. So we minister only in the Lord's divine power. Right? Remember in that text in Timothy, his, his divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. And seeing this miracle is a reminder of how ridiculously limitless the power of Christ is. And my last point this morning is the sufficiency of Christ. He alone can meet the soul needs of people. Jesus is the source of life. Now, there's, there's one thing that I'd like to point your attention to. You'll see in verses 19 through 21. Christ is pictured in this passage as the only one who is, tra- who is truly able to meet all the soul needs of people. He's showing his disciples that he alone is able to supply all the needs, material and spiritual. In fact, that is the third lesson that he teaches. You recall uh, when I said earlier, you, when he, with the, you feed them, I said there were three. Here's the last one. So the first one was it's their responsibility, show compassion. Second one is that they don't have the power in themselves. And the third lesson that we, that we learned from Jesus' statement, you feed them, is that Jesus himself is the source of life. 
He's the one who has what they need. I don't have, I don't have what they need. You don't have what they need. Man, there's so many times that some of you are so kind to invite me into the personal struggles and things that you, that you have going on in your life or the victories. And, and so many times, man, but when you're going through hard things, so many times I wish I could just like wave a magic wand and make your problems go away. But I don't have the answer in me, but he does. All I can give you is what he puts into my hand, but he is the source. He is the answer. So the disciples are to learn that in this passage in John 6, where Jesus calls himself the bread of life, he's able to give bread because he is the bread of life. He's able to feed the bodies and the souls of the people because he is the source of spiritual strength. And so the disciples need to learn that. The crowd, of course, is totally ignorant of that. I mean, we know from John 6 that this crowd, uh, by and large, was impressed with the miracle they enjoyed the food, right, and the holy mackerel, but they, 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 weren't, they weren't really impressed by Jesus' preaching. I want to point out, once again, that Jesus was still compassionate, even though he knew that many were rejecting him. Guys, this miracle points beyond the specific provision of that bread. It points beyond that. It points to the giver of the bread. It points to the giver. Jesus' point in doing this miracle is to draw the disciples' eyes from the physical provision of bread to Christ's spiritual provision for what we need for eternal life. As that food and bread was necessary for them to keep living, so the spiritual provision which, which he makes for us is necessary if we're gonna have eternal fellowship with him. And that's what Christ wanted his disciples to see. Um, in effect, he was saying that Christ is the Old Testament. He is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. God, through Moses, what? Provided manna to the children in Israel when they were in the wilderness. God, through Elijah, provided a continuous supply of flour and oil to the widow in need. God, through Elisha, fed 100 men with only 20 barley loaves and had some left over. And God, through his son, Jesus Christ, fed 5,000, and we don't even know how many more. And there were 12 baskets left. Jesus doesn't waste anything, guys. Okay, just like, oh, there just happened to be 12 baskets left, right? No, it's, it's like Matthew Henry said, those whom Christ feeds, he fills. The Lord's showing you here that he is exceedingly sufficient for you, right? He gave them so much food that they, had, they were fat and satisfied. He didn't just give them a smidgen. He didn't just give them a nibble. He didn't just give them a taste. They had 12 baskets left over of scraps, one for each apostle. They started off with five loaves and two fish and ended up with a basket apiece. That's not too bad. That's not too bad. Christ is more than sufficient for every need you have and I have. The only thing standing in the way of that, in closing, the only thing standing in the way of that is will you admit your need? Will you admit that you have a need? But we see we're prideful, right? We don't want to admit that we're poor and in need of compassion. We don't want to admit that we're sinners who have offended a holy God and offended one another. And Christ reaches out and says, I can fill every need you have. I can fill every need that you have. How many times have we faced crisis and failed to consider the all-sufficiency of Christ? the power of Christ. So what's stopping you? What's stopping you, friend? What's the obstacle in your heart today to receiving the provision that Christ says is there for you? Is it your pride? Is it your arrogance? Is it, um, is it the consequences of confessing the sin, which is between you and God and perhaps you and others? Man, I pray, I pray this day that God would break down the walls of any hard heart in this room, any pride of any hard heart in this room, and that he would draw us to Christ who feeds us eternally. And if you're a believer and you're weak and doubting, I pray that you would see again and afresh the, in this historical count the extravagant way that God can provide for you 
and that you would show him that, that faith, that childlike faith and dependence in him, that he is able to provide for every need you have. And he can fill it, and he can leave you with 12 baskets full. Now, we're going to take communion together this morning. And I feel what an appropriate text for us to jump into. The bread of life. Jesus Christ, who poured out. We, we've been talking about what? His splakidzomai, right? That's a great word to say. The splakidzomai, the compassion of Christ. Is there any better picture in the universe of the compassion of Christ than the body and the blood of Christ being poured out and broken for you and me? Is there? Man, there's not. There's not. 